in this lecture, we're going to discuss knots. And this is its own specialized subfield of topology. Obviously, we're not able to say much about knots. Uh, but what we're going to do is we're going to discuss the relevant stuff that we know, namely the fundamental group, and how the fundamental group can be used to distinguish knots. Uh, this is generally not the procedure which is used in knot theory. In knot theory, you have other procedures. So let's just say this. Uh, so knot theory is the study of knots. And uh, you can make a lot of puns because you have two very different words that mean different things. So it's very common in knot theory to say the word to say both of those words in the same sentence, sometimes right next to each other, and you have to understand which one is which. But I'm sure we can do that. So it's the study of knots. And intuitively, a knot is something in space that maybe go, goes through itself or something and then something else, something like that. It's some kind of twisted curve in space. And the main question in knot theory is, how do we tell if two knots are the same. Now, what does it mean to be the same? Well, the idea is, you see, we have this arc going over here. We can slightly, if we were to just take this arc that we had going like this, and we just introduce, let's say, a twist in it, then it's the same knot, because you can easily see you can take that twist and you can undo it. So even though you've made it look different, it's still the same. Or perhaps you can draw an arc going like this, but then you can draw another arc that's, that's just slightly deformed, and you would say it's the exact same knot because you can take that arc and you can deform it into something like that. So the so that's kind of like the main problem of knot theory. How do you determine if two knots are the same? This is also uh, actively researched. This is not some kind of old solved topic in math. People still work on this to this day. And generally, the methods that they use, methods which are generally used, is not uh, what we will talk about. But we will use the fundamental group because this is like the main tool we have been using to study problems in topology. So they generally use other methods. So why do they use other methods? Because this approach, so this is usually too hard. Using the fundamental group leads to very difficult groups that are very hard to say much about those groups. So because of that, even though you could approach knot theory through the use of fundamental groups, and that's what we'll, we'll talk about, uh, that's not usually what people do. People rely on other techniques, which are easier to work with and allow you to make conclusions that would be far too difficult to do with the fundamental group because as we will see, the fundamental group will give you a group presentation. And then you have a combinatorial group theory problem with lots of generators that you need to solve. And often those are very difficult to say anything about. So because of this, other methods are used. And in a course in knot theory, uh, that's what you learn about. You learn about the other methods that are used. Now, what the interesting thing about knot theory is some of those methods are extremely elementary. Uh, you can find some books, there are some recent books that have been released. You can find them on the American Mathematical Society website if you're interested, if you look at their newest undergraduate books that they've released. You can find some of them on knot theory and you can look through those books and there's no advanced level math that's being used in those books whatsoever. Now the drawback is they do rely heavily on pictures. So because of that, it is not exactly the most rigorous approach to knot theory. Uh, that would be like the one drawback. However, the methods are accessible. So if you're interested in this, you can even get an undergraduate book and, and read through it and see all of the modern methods. And they're actually quite elementary, and they let you distinguish be between knots quite easily. Uh, the goal of today's class, I would say, is I want to show you how the fundamental group can be used and then give you a picture-free way 
to interpret knots. So as you can see, we're drawing this picture, and a lot of the methods that are used do rely very heavily on these kinds of pictures. But it is the goal of this class is to show you how you can formalize this kind of picture using a fundamental group. And then you can then therefore formalize the things that you do in a more rigorous kind of way. So then it becomes justified to use pictures because then those, those pictures are just a visual representation of something that's a little bit more formal. Think about it. When we talked about combinatorial surfaces, we drew a lot of pictures, but those pictures were just visual representations of symbolic words and various manipulations that you do on those words. So that's kind of, I would say, the intent of today's lecture. It's not really to um, discuss knot theory the way it's done nowadays, but really to, to just show you how you can convert this picture into a group theory problem, and then you have a more rigorous um, ex uh, definition for what that picture is supposed to represent. So we will, of course, not go into um, knot theory and all of the different methods because that would actually turn into a completely different class. We just want to focus on the topology only and the use of the fundamental group. Now let me just show you this interesting picture. They have this nice picture on Wikipedia of different types of knots. The simplest knot, it's called the knot knot. Right? This is a knot knot. There's not really a knot here, so you call it a knot knot. Then you have this one. It goes like this. You call it, this is called the trefoil. This is called the figure eight. So all of these are different types of knots. And you really have an infinite amount of knots, but these are just some of them. And you see this one crosses, it, crosses itself three times. This one crosses itself one, two, three, four times. One, two, three, four, five times. One, two, three, four, five times. This one crosses one, two, three, four, five, six times. So uh, something you can ask is, so, so like for example, if you look at this knot over here, you have one, two, three, four crossings. And here you have one, two, three, no, actually you have five crossings over here. So you have four crossings. So you can kind of ask the question, and the question you can ask is, how do you prove that out of all knots that have four crossings, let's say, that this is like the only one you can have. Well, maybe I should say at most four crossings, because what you can do is, of course, just imagine that you're taking this upper arc and you just give it a small twist like this, like a small twist, and you just introduce another crossing. So maybe I should say at most four crossings. So if you have at most four crossings, then these are the only three knots that you have. So you can kind of ask that kind of question. How do you, how does one prove something like that in a rigorous way and then classify it? So just like we talk about the periodic table of elements, and classifying elements on a periodic table, we can maybe talk about like a periodic table of knots and the different type of knot objects that you can get. So that is something interesting to think about. Now, let's start with a rigorous definition for what a knot is. Here's a rigorous definition. Now, I'm going to change the notation. Usually when we talk about loops, close loops into space, uh, generally, the way we do it is we talk about the closed unit interval from 0 to 1, and then we say that f of 0 is equal to f of 1 is equal to some point p. That's been the way we've usually been doing this. But I do not want to do this anymore because this sort of focuses on the endpoints a little bit too much, and it makes it seem as if the space point is important, which it is important when you're working with the fundamental group. But in knot theory, you, you do not really care about this. Now, because the endpoints are being glued together, you can take advantage of the universal property of the quotient. So this is your mapping F, and then you have the quotient. So the quotient is the two endpoints are being glued together. So if you take the endpoints of the interval and you glue them together, you get S1. So S1 is the quotient space when you identify the endpoints together. And this is like your projection map into the quotient space. So by the universal property of the quotient, there exists a unique map, let's call it G for lack of a better name, or maybe call it F something, F prime, there's a unique map from the circle into R3 that makes the diagram commute. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between maps of this type and maps of those types. So because of this, instead of talking about mapping the closed unit interval with the endpoints identified, it's more convenient to then talk about a mapping of S1 into R3. 
and then we just forget about this because this way of doing it because it's a circle it does not really have a beginning and an end unlike an interval and so there's no we're not really fixating on some kind of point and saying there's this base point that does not move uh, so we're, this is what we have so what is a knot so there's a definition so a knot is an embedding. So we talked about embeddings before, but this is another embedding. It's an embedding of a continuous map from the circle into R3. That's what it is. It is an embedding. So it is a homeomorphism onto a closed subset of R3. It's a homeomorphism. It is an embedding of S1 into R3. So it's a homeomorphism. Now, there's some confusion that might arise out of this, and this is like the immediate question you probably want to ask. So if you have a circle, so we're saying you could map the circle into space, right? You're mapping the circle into space. And you would think that if you're mapping the circle into space, continuous, uh, continuously mapping the circle into space, the only kind of picture you can get is maybe something like this. In other words, you're getting an unknot or a knot-knot. You're getting something without technically any a knot in it. You're just getting a circle sitting inside three-dimensional space. How do you actually get those knots appearing there? How, how can you continuously deform it into something like this? Well, um, so I'll give you two answers. So the first one is you can, of course, you can do something. At first, this might seem very strange. So take this circle and cut it. Okay, so take a pair of scissors, cut your circle into two portions. And this seems strange because it seems you're doing something that's not continuous. And it's not continuous. But in the end, it's going to be continuous. So you cut the circle into two pieces. And then you take this arc and you map it to some kind of curve in space. And that curve in space will kind of go through itself somehow. And then the two points get glued together. OK, they become, they become glued together. So what you need to understand is that you're doing this in two steps. You cut, and then you glue. So you cut, you twist, and then you glue. So then, then this is actually a continuous procedure. Uh, going from the circle to the interval is not a continuous procedure, but the composition is a continuous procedure. So what you're saying is you're, you're kind of writing it as a composition. You're, you're mapping the circle into the interval first. So you're cutting the circle. Okay, you're cutting the circle into two pieces. So by cutting it, this is not continuous, but then you compose it, but then you map this into a figure that looks something like that. And then you glue the endpoints together. So this is a continuous operation. And even though this is not continuous, the composition of doing both of them directly is continuous. Because then you can see that the, the two points, this red point that got separated, it came back together again. So points that are next to the red point, they got separated. So you're breaking continuity. But then the two points that were next to this red point, they came together again to each other. And so when you look at it from beginning to end, so if you ignore the cutting step, if you look at it from beginning to end as a composition, then this is actually a continuous mapping. So yeah, this is a continuous mapping from here to here. It does look confusing because you are cutting it and then you're putting it together, but it is a continuous mapping. And so the definition does make sense. So this definition certainly allows more complicated types of shapes and space that actually have genuine knots in them. So that's what we call a knot. And let's say what it means for two knots to be the same. So two knots Now we're going to define what it means for two knots to be equivalent. But before we do that, there's a technicality that we want to discuss. And that is we want to avoid these things called wild knots. A knot, as we've said, is simply an embedding of the circle into R3. So an embedding uses a continuous mapping. But when you use continuous mappings, sometimes the embeddings can get quite complicated. And that's what we call wild knots. And it's easiest if I just show you in a picture and you get to see what, uh, what happens. So if we look at this picture over here, you're going to notice a a, a sort of like an infinite type of knot that just keeps on going and going and going. So as you can see in this kind of a picture, here you have a knot that it's sort of going back through itself forever. And you can use a limiting process to turn this into a continuous embedding of a circle into 
three-dimensional space. So this would be one way to do it. Here's another way you can do it. And in knot theory, we want to avoid knots like this. They're just way too complicated to work with. Regular knots that do not have this infinite type of, you, you can say, self-looping, um, the, the ones that have a finite amount of them are already complicated as it is. So we want to avoid these things from happening. And one way you can avoid these things from happening is by just assuming that your embedding is more than just a continuous embedding. It's a um, differentiable embedding. So what I mean is what you can do is you can, to eliminate things like this from arising up, you're going to assume that your function, so you have a function that maps the circle into R3, you can assume that your function has slightly better properties. So you can assume that this is what we call a diffeomorphism. So a diffeomorphism, it's sort of like a homeomorphism, but you assume that the mapping is actually differentiable. It's a differentiable mapping. Uh, if you're wondering what it means for a mapping to be differentiable, you can, of course, mapping a circle into R3. That's equivalent of mapping the unit interval into R3, where the two endpoints get glued together. And now you have a function of a single variable. And then you're saying a function of a single variable is differentiable. You have the three component functions because it's being mapped into R3. And that is a differentiable mapping, that the functions that you're using to define the embedding, they're differentiable functions. And then things are sort of more, they're better behaved, they're better controlled. You do not have these kinds of crazy types of embeddings. And uh, this is typically what we refer to as uh, tame knots. So in knot theory, one typically works with these things called tame knots. Uh, and those are already complicated enough. And generally, the assumption is that the embeddings are actually diffeomorphisms and not just homeomorphisms. So now that we, uh, we have addressed this technicality, I want to discuss the next thing, and that is how do we say that two knots are equivalent? So suppose uh, K1 and K2 are knots. And as we've said, we're going to assume these are what is known as tame knots which means that, well, what it basically means is that you have maps, let's say F1 from S1 into R3, and another mapping, let's call it F2, from one S1 into R3, and K1 is the image of this circle. So K1 is just, if you look at the image of the circle in R3, that's going to give you the first knot, and you call, and you call that K1, and then K2, that's the other knot that you get. So this would be F2 of S1. So these are the images of these circles the way they embed into R3. And we would, what we, we would like to do is we would like to define how do we define uh, K1 being equivalent to K2 as knots. So this does not mean homeomorphism, even though we often use this notation for either a homeomorphism or a homotopy, but here we're talking about a a knot equivalence, an equivalence of two knots. So how does one define two knots being equivalent? Now, as we indicated already, this does not mean, well, it certainly means that K1 and K2 are homeomorphic as two topological spaces, but that's not going to be the definition of a knot equivalence because all knots are homeomorphic to the circle. So they're going to be always homeomorphic to each other. So clearly that's not the way to do it. So we have to do something else. And the definition we're going to use is, there's actually di uh, several different definitions that one can use for a knot equivalence. We're going to use the one which is by far the simplest. And as we indicated that in knot theory, it's not so much about uh, the knot as a topological space, because as a topological space, it is just a circle, but it's really about how the knot sits in space. So the definition is going to be this. So here's the definition. So we say two knots. K1 and K2 are equivalent as knots. You can also call them not equivalent, which is sounds very funny. You can also say they're not equivalent. If there's a homeomorphism, so it's not a homeomorphism from one knot to the other knot, it has to be a homeomorphism of space itself. If and only if there is a homeomorphism Let's call it F for a lack of a better name. And this is the part we want to be careful about. It's not from K1 to K2. That is, of course, true. Rather, 
it is a homeomorphism of R3, of space itself, all of space into R3, so that F of K1 is equal to K2. So there's a homeomorphism of space that takes one knot to the other knot. So it's more than that. I mean, of course, they are, they are homeomorphic to each other, but we can find the homeomorphism of space itself. So it's the space around the knot as well. So there's a homeomorphism of space itself that will take one knot to the other knot. And of course, here we're talking about, as we indicated in knot theory, the technicality is we usually almost always talk about tame knots. So we can even be a little bit sloppy and we can just, from this point on, when we talk about knots, we always talk about these things called tame knots. So this is the, the definition. Now it should be clear from this definition Let's state an immediate proposition. So if K1 and K2 are equivalent, so we'll say not equivalent, not equivalent, then the fundamental group, if you were to calculate the fundamental group of the complement of the knot, the complement of K1, and you were to uh, calculate the fundamental group of the complement I meant to say pi 1, of course, the fundamental group of K2, then these are going to be isomorphic fundamental groups. So if two knots are equivalent, then they then they have an isomorphic, their complements have isomorphic fundamental groups. Of course, K1 and K2 have isomorphic fundamental groups. So maybe we should just add this. So of course, the fundamental group of K1 would be equal to the fundamental group of K2 because they're both equal to the fundamental group of the unit circle because they're homeomorphic to the unit circle. So the fundamental group of a knot will always be the group of integers, but this is about the complement of the knot. And this is actually what we call the knot group. So we call these, so this is called the knot group. So the knot group is the fundamental group of the complement of a knot, which should make sense because knot theory is all about the way a knot, which um, topologically speaking is a circle, the way it sits in three-dimensional space. So the space around it begins to matter and the space around it is exactly the complement. So this certainly makes sense. And this is what we call the knot group. So the knot group is always the complement, the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. So if two knots are equivalent, then they have the same knot group. Now this should be fairly straightforward to see why this is true. This is quite, quite simple to prove. So here's the proof of this, it's quite simple. Proof, we'll say just indeed, the complement of R3, K1, is homeomorphic to the complement of K2. Why? So we're going to pick a homeomorphism, let's call it F, from R3 to R3, so that F of K1 is equal to K2. Why can we do that? Well, it's actually very simple, because that's by definition of knot equivalence. Two knots are equivalent if there's a homeomorphism of space itself. So not just a homeomorphism between two knots, but there's a homeomorphism of space, of all of space, that will map one knot into the other knot. So that's the definition of, equi of knot equivalence. So this is just by definition. So since the two knots are homeomorphic, there's a, I'm sorry, since the two knots are equivalent, there's a homeomorphism that will take, of R3, that will take K1 to K2. So now we can, so now we can define, so now restrict this mapping F to a smaller, to a smaller domain. And we're going to just call this mapping F again for abuse of notation. Technically, it's a different function because it's being restricted to a smaller domain, but we'll call it F again. So this is the mapping that takes R3 take away K1, and it maps it to the complement of K2. We're calling this F again. And this works because if you pick something that is not in K1, then this function f will map it to something that's not in K2. 
This is a homeomorphism. This is a bijection. So in particular, this subset K1, this subset K1, and this subset K2, there's a homeomorphism between those two. So there's a bijection between those two. So if you pick something that's not in K1, whatever point that is, F will map that point into something that is not in K2. So this is a bijection. So this is going to be a, so whatever this is, that mapping is a homeomorphism. It's a homeomorphism. You're just restricting a homeomorphism to a smaller domain, but you still have a homeomorphism. And thus, if they're homeomorphic, then they have the same fundamental group. So the fundamental group of R3 of the complement of K1 will be isomorphic to the fundamental group of the complement of K2. And that would complete the proof. So it's actually a very simple proof that if two knots happen to be equivalent, then it means that the knot group, and again, the knot group is defined as the complement of the knot, will therefore be isomorphic as groups. But what is interesting and what is amazing is that the converse is also true. So this is the, the theorem. And this is a very difficult theorem, which we're not going to prove. This is, so this is a, a theorem you can say for the expert. So for people who specialize in knot theory, for people who put in a lot of, a lot of time and a lot of learning into specializing in knot theory, this is a very specialized result in knot theory. And it's the converse of this, which says that if K1, K2 have isomorphic, isomorphic knot groups, then K1 and K2 are not equivalent. So then you have two equivalent knots. And in fact, this is a very recent theorem. This is from 1989. So this is not like one of those theorems from like 100 years ago. This is quite recent. And knot theory is a fairly recent area of mathematics. And just to show it to you, maybe if you're interested, there's a paper here. I never read this paper because I do not specialize in knot theory. But there's a paper over here that you're not going to understand it. But maybe one day you will understand it. Maybe one day you get interested in this kind of stuff. And you'll put in the time, and you'll learn it, and you'll understand it. So uh, the name of this paper are knots are determined by their complements. and as you can see, it says two smooth. You see, the assumption here is the embeddings, the embeddings, you have two knots, K and K prime. And he says S3, the three sphere. The reason why the authors here say S3 and not R3 is it's exactly how it works with the two-dimensional sphere. As we have saw before, the two-dimensional plane embeds into the two-dimensional sphere. So in exactly the same way, the three-dimensional three -dimensional space embeds into the three-dimensional sphere. So a lot of people like to do knot theory in S3 as opposed to R3, but it really is the same thing because S3 is a compact space, so maybe it's a bit more convenient. But anyway, the assumption here is he says two knots, and he says smooth in the sense that the embeddings of the circles are diffeomorphisms. That uh, That's what he means by smooth over here. So two knots are equivalent. So this is the definition. If there exists a homeomorphism, so we said from, uh, from R3 to R3, but you can also do this on the three sphere that will map uh, one knot into the other knots. So he says that this immediately implies that they're homeomorphic. The complements are homeomorphic. But uh, yeah, so that implies that the complements are homeomorphic. And what they say is that if two knots have homeomorphic complements, then they are equivalent. So this is the, the theorem. So the complements determines the knot. So this is just a result that we will accept. We're not going to prove it. As you can see, it's quite complicated. Uh, actually, it has to do with three-dimensional manifolds because knot theory is ultimately three. It's a problem in three-dimensional manifolds. And so there's a very big overlap between knot, the, knot theory and three-dimensional manifolds. So this is what we will accept and we will use from this point on. And what's interesting about this paper, this is a very well-known paper, and this is what is a good example of a good math paper. Here you have two authors on this paper, uh, but a lot of the most important math papers in history have a single author. So you have, here you have two authors, but if you look, I think what's interesting, if you look at the very end and you look at the, if you look at the references, look how many references, just one, two, three, four, five, six, 
seven, eight, nine. There's only nine references that's being used. Some of them are probably a little bit redundant. That's often the case. So there's nine references, and this is an extremely well-known paper in knot theory, prob probably one of the most well-known ones in knot theory. And as you can see, the paper is, well, this one happens to be a, a little bit long, but there's two authors with like nine, nine references. And this is, of course, in comparison to some of the papers you have nowadays, which have 50,000 authors on one paper and 7 million citations in the end. But in the end, no one cares about the paper. So it's like, if it's good quality, it's good quality. Um, usually one author, maybe at most two authors, very few references in the end. That's often a good indication when it's a, like a more serious math paper. So this is the result on knot theory, which we will assume and we'll use um, from this point on assuming this result. So for the time being, I'm going to draw pictures. So, so let's say for now we're going to draw a lot of pictures. And then we're going to, let's say, eliminate pictures. And then say how pictures can be eliminated. But pictures are important because that's where the motivation comes from. So let's look at the circle. So we have, so this is our three-dimensional space. Okay, that's our three-dimensional space. You can think of this box as representing R3. Now, of course, R3 goes out to infinity, but the box is just a way to help you visualize it. And let's draw the unknot. So what we're going to do is let us find, let us, let's say, visualize the knot group of the knot knot. So the knot knot would go like this. Here's a circle sitting inside R3. So this is the most simple type of embedding you can have, where it's not like doing all of those different kinds of loops and up over crossings or under crossings or anything like that. Now, to find the knot group, you're going to look at the complement of the circle. So you're going to pick something that is not actually on the circle. You have to pick a point that's not on the circle. So you pick a point. It doesn't really matter where you pick the, the, the point, because when you calculate the fundamental group based at that point, they will all be isomorphic to each other. So you're going to pick a point, so let's say somewhere over here, which is not, which is not on, the, on the circle. And you're going to draw loops. So you're going to draw loops in the complement. So the loops will not actually intersect the circle. So here's some examples of loops. You can draw a loop like this. But that loop homotopes, right? Th th this loop uh, homotopes down to a single point, right? You can kind of continuously deform it to a single point. If you have a loop, let's say, goes like this, you can deform that loop to a single point. All you have to do is you take this loop, you pull it towards you, so it is in front of the circle. So maybe this loop goes above the circle, but you have all this space in front of you, so you can pull the loop towards you, you deform it towards you, and now the loop is like towards you. And then from that point on, you can just shrink it back down to a point because it's not hitting the, 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 blue, the blue circle. However, you can have a loop that goes like this. It kind of goes like that, and then it goes through the circle. So if the loop goes through the circle, then it becomes clear that you can no longer shrink the loop down to a single point because the circle will prevent you, will get in the way of doing it. So the loop can either go in one orientation or you can make it go in the other orientation. And the two orientations, you cannot deform one into the other. That probably should be clear. So if you go, let's say, let's say you go something like this. It makes sense that there's no way how you can, if this point stays fixed, there's no way how you can move this around to make it reverse its path and go the other way around. So these should be homotopically different. And you can also imagine that your loop possibly goes around a second time. It goes in, it goes in, 
well, actually, maybe I should have done it like this. It kind of goes through in a second time through it. You can kind of loop it twice around the circle, and then you can loop it three times around the circle and so forth. So if you use your intuition, what would your intuition tell you? So your intuition should tell you that the fundamental group of the complement of the circle, so if C is that circle, it should be the group of integers. It's very similar to when you talk about lo loops in the punctured plane. It's a bit more complicated because you're in space, but if you had to guess, this is what you would guess. Of course, if you want to turn it into a more rigorous proof, then you actually have to write a proof out of it and all of that, use the Seifert von Kampen theorem and all of that, or try to find maybe a simpler way to do it. But then, but let's not go there yet. Uh, let's just maybe uh, develop the intuition first. So that's what you would guess. Now let's look at the next example, and this is the simplest example of a, so this is the simplest example of a not, not, not. So what you would say a genuine not. So a not not is a fake not. It's like a circle. And a not 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 is a genuine not. So the simplest one is called the trefoil. This is the, the one that occurs. So the, basically the way you draw a trefoil is you take a piece of rope. So you take a piece of rope. You And then you just create the most simple knot, right? Like if, if I ask you to create the most simple knot, you would just take that piece of rope, you would cross it over itself, but then in order to get a knot, the two endpoints need to be connected. So then you take those two endpoints and you connect them together and you get something called the trefoil. So let me show you a picture of the trefoil so you get to see it. This is the, the simplest. Here's a picture of the trefoil. So this would be the trefoil knot. Okay, so it's this knot, it's sitting inside space. As you can see, it goes underneath it, it goes over it, it goes underneath and it goes like that. So that, that is what would you get. So if you take a piece of rope and you make the simplest type of knot you can imagine, you take those two loose ends and you glue them together at the top and this is the kind of figure you would get. So this is the trefoil knot. And I think we can agree that there's no way how you can manipulate and move this knot around in space to make these crossings disappear. You cannot turn this into a circle by using an isotopy. So I think we will agree with that, but the challenge here is how do you actually prove it rigorously? That's gonna be the challenge. So uh, let's discuss how you calculate the fundamental group. And we're going to develop this thing that is called the Vertiger representation. So this is the method. This is called the, Ver the Vertiger representation of the knot group. So this is one way to do it. So the idea is is you're going to take a complicated knot. And let me see if I can find, yeah, you're gonna take a complicated knot. So let's say, I'm gonna just make up a random drawing. It's a totally random drawing. Let's say we go like this. Let's say this one goes underneath it. Let's say there's something that goes underneath this one. And then kind of goes like this. And then this one goes underneath that one. And let's say there's something that goes like this. And then this one goes underneath underneath uh, that. Well, actually, it seems, oh, yeah, I have another end over here that I have to close off. So let's say this goes like that. and it gets closed off. Okay, so this is a knot. 
Okay, so this is going to be a knot. And the Vertiger representation, it explains to you how you find the, actually, I just realized there's a problem. The problem is we have this end, which is not closing anywhere. Um, well, you know what? So I failed. So I have an end over here, and I have a, these two ends are not closing up. So I actually have to close them up somehow. So let me do that for you. So this end, let's end goes through this, and then they close up like that. Okay, so it's just, so here's a knot. Now it's possible that maybe this knot is actually a knot knot. It's possible that maybe there's a way to undo all of these and just reduce it back to a circle through an isotopy. Uh, of course, that's, th th there's, th there's no easy way to just see that automatically. And that's kind of the whole point of knot theory is to be able to figure that out by using some kind of process without you just taking those pictures and moving them around and hoping you can get a circle in the end. So, he, so here's the way the Vertiger representation of the knot works. So he said, this is what you're going to do. You're going to take, you're going to put an orientation on this picture. So as I indicated, what we're doing right now is highly visual. I just want to show you how it looks like so you get to see how to use it. And then we'll say how you can do it picture free. But knot theory is very, is very commonly done using pictures anyway. And in fact, the way I like to think about it is this picture is supposed to represent something. It's just a shorthand of representing something. But you can describe it as a more formal type of object. But for now, we have this. So what the Vertiger representation is, is like you're going to look at this. So you're going to create these arcs. So you have this arc over here. So we have this arc. So it kind of goes like this. That's our orientation. We follow the orientation. And we have an arc going like that. I kind of messed it up a little bit in the end. So we have an arc going like this. And we can call this, it says go, go ahead and call this A1. That entire arc is going to be called A1. And then this arc gets to a crossing. It gets crossed over. When it gets crossed over, you continue it, but along a you give it a different name. So now you're going to give it a different name. So you're going to continue it over here. So you're going to follow the orientation. You're going to continue it like this. And you're going to call this, you're going to call this A2. Okay? And then when it gets to when you get to a crossing, right? This is a crossing. You're going to give it a, a name and you're going to call it you're going to call that A3. So that's going to be A3. And then you have another crossing right over there. That one's going to be called A4. And then you're going to have this piece. So that piece is going to be A A5. So you're doing it in order. You see that you're doing it in order. So then you would have this one will be A6. That would be A6. And then you would continue. This one would just continue. That would be A7. And then you would have A8. So that entire thing would be A8. It would be A8. And then you continue to A9, which would go like this. So that would be A9. And so on. I'm not going to do all of it. You get the idea. So you're doing it in order. OK, you're doing it in order. And of course, we, could, we should put an orientation on all of these. So we follow this orientation. We make up an orientation and we go along this orientation. So there's an orientation here. So let's just introduce more of these orientation arrows. It goes like this. It goes like this. So we're just following the orientation. We just follow the orientation. Like this. So we just keep on following the orientation. And you have these arcs. Okay. So you have your arcs. So A1, okay, so, so these are your arcs. Now, when you create the fundamental group, so let's say this knot is called K. So this is some knot that's sitting inside space. And you're going to call this K. So 
what you do next is you want to calculate the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. So it's the complement. You want to be in the complement. So you want to avoid this entire picture. It's the complement of the knot. And whenever we calculate the base point, there's always, whenever we calculate the fundamental group, there's always a base point that's being used. Uh, here, the base point does not really matter, but just because it's part of the definition of the fundamental group, we have to draw it somewhere. So let's say we draw the base point P right over here. That's going to be our point P. It does not matter where you put it. The fundamental groups in the end will all be isomorphic to each other. So that's going to be our point right over there, P. Okay, so it's going to be our point. And now we're going to we're going to draw loops around these arcs. So at P. So here's the, so here's the vertiger representation. So the vertiger representation says that this is going to be equal to. So this is going so the fundamental group is going to be described using generators and relations, just like the other groups. So the generators will be. So the generators will be all of these. Well, actually, I should give you the. Okay, so I should do this first. So what are the loops? These are going to be the loops at P that we will use. So what loops are going to generate the fundamental group? So it's going to be the loops that go around the arcs. So the loops that go around these arcs. So for example, let's look at the first arc, A1. This is our very first arc. We're going to draw a loop that goes around this arc. So we're going to loop it around. We're going to loop it around, right? Because that's basically what we do. We're going to loop it. We're going to draw a loop that goes like this, right? We're going to draw one loop around A1, only A1 and nothing else. Now, of course, the question is, when we draw this loop, how do we choose the orientation of this loop? Does it go like this? Or does it go like this? So how do we do it? So you use something called the right hand rule. The orientation of the knot will determine the orientation of that loop. So you see the orientation of the knot points this way. So you're going to draw, you're going to position your right hand, your right thumb. So that's your right thumb. Okay, that's your thumb. And these are your fingers. Right, this is like your hand. Right, that's going to be your hand. Okay, that was, I think, maybe could have been a little bit better. This is like your hand. So imagine, so you can do this yourself. Take your right hand. This is your thumb. Your thumb is pointing out. Okay, so these are like your, your these are your, your four fingers, and you just close them. So close your four fingers as if you're making a, a fist, but keep your thumb pointed out and align your thumb to be pointed in the direction of this, of this arc. And now you curl your fingers. So open and close your hand, open and close your fist. And as you do that, that will tell you which way you're moving. Your fingers will move in the direction. So if you're doing this, you will notice that here, the orientation goes like this. Okay, so that would be the orientation here. And then you do this. So you're going to do you're going to you're going to draw these loops around every single one of these arcs. So the next arc is A2. So here's the arc A2. So we're going to draw a loop. So let's say we make our loop. Maybe I should use maybe I should make it be a little bit thinner so it's easier to tell it apart. So we're going to have this loop. And it's going to go here, and it's going to go like this, and then it's going to return back to the starting base point. You see, we just drew a loop only around A2 and nothing else. That was the only one we drew a loop around. We only drew it around A2 and nothing else. So does the loop go around like this, or does it go around like this? So you use the right-hand rule. So you see it points in that direction, so if you put your right hand in the direction of your right thumb in the direction of the orientation and then you curl your fingers then you will notice that it goes like this okay it goes like this so so this is the vertiger representation so the vertiger representation says that the fundamental group of this complement is going to be generated by a1 a2 and so on where these these are the loops that go around the arcs, okay? So, so AI is not the arc. Rather, AI is the loop 
that goes around the arc. Because the fundamental group consists of loops. So when we're writing that pi 1 is equal to this, do not interpret A1 as this. Okay, Do not interpret it as this path. That would make no sense at all. Because the fundamental group consists of loops. It has to be a loop that is based at P. So you just simply draw a loop that goes around the arc. So that's the correct way to interpret it. So these are not the arcs. Those are the loops that go around the arcs. And all of those loops begin and end at that point P. So that would be the generator of the fundamental. So those are the generators for the fundamental. And yeah, so those would be the generators for the fundamental group. But what about the relations? So what are the relations? What are the relations? So that's what's missing. So in combinatorial group theory, we describe a group through its generators and then its relations that, they, that those generators satisfy. So at the moment, we have described the generators. So now we're going to describe the, the relations. So here is how we describe the relations. So there's two types of crossings. Two types of crossing types. Two types of crossings. You can have your arc. So I'm going to write AI again, but you need to understand that AI in the fundamental group, AI does not actually represent the arc. It represents the loop that goes around the arc. So we're being abusive in the notation because we have two different interpretations of the same symbol. But we just have to understand that in the fundamental group, it's always about loops. So we have AI here. And then it continues. It's being crossed over by something else. So you can go. You can go. So the loop. So the. OK, so. When you're finding the vertiger representation of the fundamental group you are when when the arc stops and it's being cut you continue the the path and the one that goes after it is going to be ai plus one that's the next one that goes after it okay so that's the one that goes after it it's the, it's the one that follows it so if this one is ai and it's being cut by something the one that goes after it the next arc that's the one you call ai plus one and there's something that's being crossed over. So the one that's crossing over it, we're going to call this AJ. It's some other one. So the one that crosses over it does not have to follow the consecutive, the consecutive order of these arcs. Because these are the ones that go, so this one, this piece of the arc is the one that immediately follows this one. Whereas that one, there could be a lot of complicated stuff going around over here before you reach AJ. So you can have an A2, an A5, an A20, and then you reach like an A30. So the indexing that does not have anything to do with those. So we call that an AJ. So this is one crossing type. And the other crossing type will go like this. You can have AI and AI plus one. And then you have one that goes like this, AJ. So there's two types of crossings that you can have. When the arcs get cut into two pieces and they're being crossed over by another arc, these are the two different kinds of situations that may happen. Some of you might be thinking, well, I can imagine other ones. Well, uh, what if it goes like this? What if this is AI, like AI, and then you have AI plus one, and then you have something going like this. But then you see, even though you think this is something new, it's not. It's just a rotated picture of this one. So really, these are the only two things that happen. And if you come across, so the vertiger representation would be this, that if you have this type of crossing, then this is the relation you're going to write down. You're going to write AI, AJ inverse, AI plus 1 inverse, and then AJ is equal to 1. And in this type of crossing, the relation is going to be AI, AJ, AI plus 1 inverse, and AJ inverse is equal to 1. So the kind of relation you get between the generators, so these are going to be the generators. So here's what you need to understand. In, there's there's abuse of notation that's taking place in this picture these are representing the the arcs but in the relation these are representing the loops the ai here that's the loop that goes around ai aj here is the loop that goes around aj so this is the relationships that you will have in the fundamental group 
So these are the two types of crossings. The question is, of course, why? Why do you get these relationships? Where do they come from? Like, what's the explanation for that? So uh, there's a very nice picture. So if you want to look at this more carefully, there's a book. It's called, I think it's called Classical, Classical Topology and uh, Combinatorial Group Theory by Stillwell. Stillwell has a lot of good books on mathematics, and this is one of those books that he's written. This is a graduate text in mathematics. Uh, I've read through like half of this book, and if you just want a quick review, I would say that it's, it's not appropriate for a first course in topology. So if you're learning topology for your very first time, you would probably get very, very confused. That book is very visual. It focuses a lot more on intuition. There's a lot less proofs in there. And it's more appropriate for someone who already is comfortable with the formal side of topology. And you want to look at more visual kinds of things. So he calls it classical topology because historically, a lot of problems in topology, they involve curves, surfaces, knots, uh, three-dimensional manifold. So a lot of classical stuff in topology from like 100 years ago or something, it used it. it, it it was highly visual, and it used a lot of, uh, of the fundamental group in order to solve the problems. And in the preface to the book, he, he said he wanted to write a book on topology that brings back a lot of the visual side of topology. Because after all, the purpose of one of the purposes of topology was to help solve these highly visual problems uh, and make them and, and to find mathematical solutions to those problems. And then he said that nowadays in topology courses, a lot of the visualization is lost, and people never get to see that. So he thought it would be appropriate to write a book on that. So I would say it's a good book for a second reading in topology as opposed to a first reading. And then even then, there will still be probably a lot of parts in the book that are confusing. And you will probably need the assistance of someone to help you uh, explain it to you. There will definitely be a lot of parts in the book that are confusing. But uh, it, it does have this interesting approach to topology where it tries to make it a lot more visual. Uh, and that's why he calls it classical topology. And he gives a very nice picture in that book that explains where these relationships come from. So I'm going to put that picture on the screen and then we'll see and then we're going to see uh, what why these are the relations. So let me just bring up that picture. So give me a moment to bring up that picture uh, and then we'll discuss those relationships. So here's the explanation for those relationships. So notice that you have a point over here, P, and that point is the base point in the fundamental group. And then you have an arc. So let's look at this arc over here. So as you can see, the pointer on your screen is pointing towards that arc. So he actually uh, has two different symbols. He has an alpha and an A to tell them apart. We're being a little bit more sloppy and we're calling both of them A. So uh, that pointer is showing you this arc alpha I. And then this arc alpha I gets cut at this crossing. That is the crossing that cuts through alpha I. And it continues on the other side as a different arc that is now called alpha I plus one. Now where do you get the loops? So the loops are all based at P. Those are the loops. So you have a loop and it's going to, you're going to draw a loop around every single one of those arcs. So around the arc alpha I, you will have to use your right hand rule to determine the orientation. So if you do it correctly, then the orientation of the loop is supposed to look like that. So let me draw for you the right hand and then we'll understand how this goes. So this is your thumb. Okay, that's your thumb. And that's the rest of your hand. Okay, so that would be the rest of your hand. That, that is your thumb. And now imagine that you take your fingers so you, and you curl them towards your palm. And if you do that, then the direction of orientation is therefore consistent with that loop alpha, not alpha, AI. So that's the way it goes. And then you can check that the other two loops that go around the other two arcs uh, are oriented the correct way. 
And now you have two types of crossings. So the crossing, he's calling it alpha J. So the alpha I is, is underneath it. Alpha I plus one is underneath it. And the one that goes over it is called alpha J. And here's the explanation for those relationships. So let's look at, there's two types of crossings, type one and type two. You do not need to know which one is which. It's completely arbitrary. So there's two types of crossings. So notice what he's doing over here. You have your, so you're trying to create, you're trying to create a closed path that is homotopically trivial. Something that completely avoids the knot and stays completely outside the knot. So here's the way you do it. So you start over here. You start with alpha i. And you're going to draw these paths that always stay underneath the knot. You're going to draw them underneath the knot. So if you follow the orientation of alpha i and you go alpha i, then by drawing, if you use the loop alpha i. So notice, let's go back to the picture at the very top. So notice that alpha i, it is looping around. So ai is looping around alpha i. So here's the ai. It loops around alpha i. And this is the orientation that it follows. So there's the orientation that you get. But now you're going to use alpha j inverse. You're going to use the you're going to go in the opposite orientation because if you actually follow the correct orientation, so the correct orientation is presented on the picture at the top. So the picture on the top, you have your alpha i. That is the orientation that it has. So if you use alpha j with its correct orientation, then you're going to generate something that goes like this. You're going to go above that knot, and you do not want to do that. You do not want to go above the knot. You want to go underneath it. You're drawing all of these underneath it. So alpha J inverse would go in the opposite orientation, and it therefore, by using the opposite orientation, you're going underneath your knot. You're staying underneath it. And for the same reason, you have your other loop, AI plus one. So if you follow, if you use the positive orientation, then your loop, once you get to that point, will go like this. And then you're going above the knot. You see, you're traveling above the knot. You want to stay underneath the entire knot. So that's why the orientation here is with the negative. It's the reversal path, and then this one goes in the correct orientation underneath it. And then the composition of all four of those paths will produce for you a closed loop that stays entirely underneath the knot. So because it stays entirely underneath it, that closed loop can now be shrunk down to a point because the knot is not getting in the way of the shrinking. So let's look at crossing number two. It's the same idea. If you look at the picture that is drawn in the book, if you look at the composition of all four of those, if you look at the closed loop that you form, this is a closed loop that is entirely sitting underneath your knot. And so you can shrink it down to a point because the knot's not getting in the way. Like none of these arcs, like none of these paths are getting in the way of those arcs. So there's room to shrink it down to a point and therefore it becomes trivial. So that's the reasoning behind why those are the relations that we have. So in the end, you can always derive it like this, but in the end, in the end, uh, these are the crossing relation types. So if it crosses like this, you have this type of relation that is formed. And if it crosses like this, then you have that type of relation that is formed. So let me show you two interesting examples where you can use this. So let me remove this. So we talked about knots, but we can also talk about these things called links. So for example, if you have two circles, this is called the unlink. This is called the unlink. And when they go like this, let me try drawing this again. So if it goes like this, So this is called a link. It's not exactly like a knot. A knot consists of just one circle, but here you have two circles. 
but it's the same idea. You can use the vertiger representation here as well. So the way, this is how the vertiger representation will go. We want to show, let's say, that it is not possible to take a link and unlink it like this. Now, of course, that sounds ridiculous. That sounds silly. Of course, we know we cannot do that. But the point is to illustrate that we have a, a, a topological way to demonstrate that by using the tools that we have. So I think that's the part which is interesting. Of course, the conclusion is not surprising, but it's nice to see how you can use the tools that we put in a lot of effort to develop to be used to solve this type of problem. So we want to show that the link, you cannot unlink these two and make it become that. And you do this by calculating the fundamental group of the complement. So let's call this U for the unlink. So it's not U for open set. It's not an open set in space. It's a closed set, of course. But U for the unlink and L for the link. And we're going to calculate the fundamental group of the of the unlink. And here, the way you do it is, using vertiger representations, you're going to draw some kind of arc. And here, you're going to draw another type of arc. And then you say that the fundamental group is generated by A1 and A2. So the A1 and A2 are not representing the arcs. The A1 and A2 are representing the loop that goes around the arc. So you have some kind of point, and that's the loop that goes around it. And then you have another loop that goes around this one. So this is really what A1 and A2 represent with the correct orientations. So we're being a little bit sloppy. So Stillwell is a little bit more careful. He calls them alpha 1 and alpha 2 to sort of tell them apart. I'm just being a bit more sloppy here. So technically, alpha 1 and alpha 2 are representing these loops at P that go around these two circles. So it will be alpha 1 and alpha 2. And notice they never cross. So since they never cross, there is no relation to put here. And in the end, you just get that this is the free group of rank 2, which makes sense, right? Because there's no way how you can move this loop over to the other circle. So whatever happens here is completely unrelated what happens there. So that's the reason why you have a, a free group of rank 2, because there's no relationship between A1 and A2 here. There's no way how you can move from one to the other. So it makes sense. So the unlink, the fundamental group, is a free group of rank 2. But what about this? So here's how we do this one. We're going to draw two arcs. So one of these arcs will go like this. So we're going to draw this one. Let's draw this one to be. So let's call this arc to be A1. OK, and then this is our other arc. This is our arc A2. So we're going to introduce orientations on these. It's actually arbitrary. Let's say we go like this, like arbitrary. So these are going to be the orientations that we introduce. And we're going to calculate, so then the fundamental group of the complement of the link is going to be generated by A1 and A2. And again, they're not really generated by these two. It's really being generated by a loop that goes around both of them, goes around this one and goes around the other one. That's really what it's being generated by, which we're calling A1 and A2 again. And then we're going to satisfy the relationships. So the relationships that are being satisfied are determined by the vertiger. So these are like the vertiger relationship that is being satisfied. So here's the way that it goes. Notice that this red circle this red circle, it, this is alpha, so it goes out, it goes A1, right? A1, it goes like this. So this is A1. Then it's being crossed over by A2, being crossed over, and then it continues back to A1 again. So in this case, I know that previously we've written AI and AI plus one, but in this particular case, the two arcs are actually the same arc. So you have A, A1 and A1. So you have these two. And the one that's crossing it over, that's the other one that's called A2. So this one would be A2. So let's see how it crosses over. So this one goes from bottom to top, and this one crosses over from left to right. It goes from left to right. So it goes from left to right. So it goes like this. So if we read off the vertiger relationship, this is the one. So the vertiger relationship here would be A1. It's A1. Then it's the one that crosses over. So this one's going right, so it goes positive. So it's A2. Then the one that goes above it will now be A1 inverse. And then you copy A2 again, but this time in the opposite direction. So A2 inverse is equal to 1. So that's the vertiger relation. And then you have, so this is the vertiger relation for this crossing. You have to do it for every crossing. And then you have to do the vertiger relation for the other crossing. So let's see how the other crossing goes. The other crossing is, you can see that at the crossing, you have 
alpha 2 going in, and then you have, I'm sorry, A2 going in and A2 coming out. So A2 is going in, A2 is coming out, so it comes in, it comes out, and it's being cut through A1. It's being cut through A1. And what's the orientation? So you're going, so this is bottom, this is top, and this one is going from, so A1 is going from right to left, right? It goes from right to left, so it goes like this, from right to left. So when you write down the vertigo representations, you will have A2, you go this one, then you have A1 going in the opposite one, A1 inverse, then you have the one above it, which is A2, and then you have A1 inverse again, and this is equal to 1. And if we, so this one does seem to be a little bit unusual. I think I made a mistake somewhere. I, it's supposed to be the same, it's supposed to be basically the same thing. So I think I made a mistake. Yeah, I see why I made a mistake. So it's A2, it's A1 inverse, then it's A2 inverse. So sorry about that. It's A2 inverse, and then it's A1 without the inverse. Yeah, that's the way you do it. So I just made a mistake, which is basically the same thing. So if you rewrite this, so let's rewrite this. So this is just a different way of saying you can move the A1 over to the other side and the A2 over to the other side. So actually, you can move, so you can move the A2 over to the other side, and then you can move the A1 over to the other side. So this one is saying that A2, A1, A2 is equal to A2, A1. And this one is saying that, well, you can move these over to the other side. So this one's saying that A1 inverse A2 inverse is equal to A2 inverse A1 inverse. And if you take the inverse of both sides, this is A1 A2 is equal to A2 A1. So it's again saying the same thing as this. So both of these relationships are actually the same relationship. And so then the fundamental group is generated by those two loops, and they satisfy the relationship that A1 A2 is equal to A2 A1. And what is this? Well, this is z times z, right? That's z times z because you have two generators, but they commute, so it's a commutative group. Notice these are different. This is, this group is not commutative. This group is commutative. So that, that means these are not isomorphic. And because they're not isomorphic, it shows that the unlink cannot be continuously moved into position to be a link. So that's, that's the conclusion out of this. So this is an example involving links, but I know earlier we were talking about knots, so let's do an example involving a knot. So let's do the example involving the trefoil knot. Our next example of the vertigo representation is to find the group of the complement of the trefoil. So this on your screen is the trefoil knot. And the way we find the vertigo representation as we've said, is you going to go around this knot. You're going to choose some kind of orientation. So here's the way the picture is going to go. We're going to have some orientation that would go like this. Let's say this is our orientation. And we're going to give this arc a name. Let's call this arc A1. And then we're going to continue. We have one that goes like this. That arc is going to be called A2. And then we're going to have another arc that goes like this. And this arc we're going to call that arc A3. So these are going to be the three arcs that we have. And now what I would like to comment is uh, the convention is we do it in sequential order. So arc 1 goes to arc 2, arc 2 goes to arc 3, and then arc 3, the one that goes after it, it returns back to itself. So it follows what we can say uh, cyclical order. So it, it, it goes mod 3. Let me just draw some more orientation arrows over here so we get to see them. And then what we're going to do after that is we're going to look at the crossings. So let's highlight the crossings that we have. We have three crossings. So we have a crossing over here. Maybe I should make this a little bit thicker so you see it a little bit better. So we have three crossings. We have a crossing that occurs right over here. We have a crossing that occurs here. And we have a crossing that occurs over there. So we have three crossings. And the way we get the vertigo representation is we have to look at every one of the crossings and write down the relations that we get out of that. So let's look at this crossing. Let me actually use the crossing. Let me use this crossing. It does not really matter which one. I want to use the one that is being pointed to on the screen. So this is the crossing where the A1 arc 
moves into the A2 arc and it's being cut across by the A3 arc. So if we draw a little picture in the upper right corner, here's the way it goes. We have an A1 arc that goes into an A2 arc and it's being cut across from right to left by an A3 arc. Okay, so we have this. And what we do after this is we write down the correct relation. So the relation here would be this. The relation would be A1, A3 inverse, A2 inverse, A3 is equal to 1. So that right there is the relation that you're looking at. Now what we can do is we can move the A1 over to the right, and we can move the A3 over to the right. When we do that, we would end up with A3 inverse, A2 inverse, is equal to A1 inverse on the left and A3 inverse on the right. And then finally, we can remove the inverses by taking the inverse of both sides. Of course, in the group, when you take the inverse of both sides, is you have to reverse the order of the factors. So then this would be A2, A3 is equal to A1. I'm sorry about that. Let me take that back. That would be A3, A2. I'm sorry, that's also incorrect. A3, A1. So this is the, the, the order here that they follow some kind of cyclical order. And you can probably guess what the pattern is. You see it goes A2, A3, and then it goes A3, A1. And the other, so there's going to be three relations in total. That's just one of the relation. And they will all have a very similar kind of, uh, they will all have the same kind of relation. It's just different permutations of these three numbers. So let's return back to our main screen and therefore write down the, the group presentation for the complement of this knot. So now that we have so now that we have an idea of how one of the crossings look like, because the trefoil has so much symmetry to it, the other ones will be very similar. So this will be the knot group, the knot group for the trefoil. And again, this is not the fundamental group of the trefoil. This is the fundamental group of the complement of the knot. So the group here, this would be the group that has three generators, A1, A2, and A3. Uh, by the way, to quickly remind you, because this is important, the, these three are not referring to the arcs. Those are referring to the loops that go around the arcs, okay? So basically you have an arc, okay? So this is like an arc. Then you have some point, right? This is your base point, base point in the complement. And this arc has a certain orientation to it. This arc has an orientation. And what A1 is referring to, if the name of the arc is 1, the actual loop, because the fundamental group consists of loops, that is the loop that will go around the arc with the correct orientation that is determined by the right-hand rule. And in this case, it will go like this. So really, when we write A1, we really are referring to the loop that goes around that one single arc. That's basically what, what we're saying. We're just calling it A1, A2, A3 again because we're sloppy, but we really have to interpret it in the correct way. So these will be the three generators, and then the relations would be exactly what we said. It would be, it will follow, it would be what we've just said. It would go as follows. It would be, it would be A1, A2 is equal to A2, A3. It would be A2, A3 is equal to A3, A1. And the last relation would be A3, A1 is equal to A2, A3. Uh, I'm sorry about that. That is incorrect. This would be A1, A3, A1, A1, A2. So this would be the group that presents the complement of the trefoil knot. This is the way it goes. This is the nice pattern. It's sort of like 1, 2, 2, 3, 2, 3, 3, 1, 3, 1, 1, 2. Uh, you will actually notice that one of these relations is completely redundant. Uh, so let's look at this. Like, you see, we're saying that A1, A2 is A2, A3, but A2, A3 is A3, A1. And so basically what we're saying is A1, A2 is A3, A1, which is exactly this. So this one is a consequence of the first two relations. So this one is completely redundant. Okay, this is completely redundant, so we can toss it away. Though it's nice to see that it fits together with these two. If this was in contradiction with those two, then we'll just mean the group does not even exist or something like that. It would just be in, in contradiction. But just a quick, it's just a simple check to see it's a consequence of these two. So we have this. So this is the not group for the trefoil. And what we claim is, so the claim is that G is not Z. And what is Z? And Z, this is the knot group, 
the knot group for the knot knot. So this is the the knot, which is just like it's just the the circle, right? It's the one which is not what you would not really call a knot. It's like a fake knot. Uh, there's no knot in it. It's just a circle. So the, the, the not group of the circle is the group of integers. So if we can show that z is not the group of integers, that means that the trefoil is actually a distinct knot from this one. So how do we show that g is not z? So the first thing you want to try so this is the first thing you want to try is you want to abelianize this problem. So basically, instead of looking at this as a group presentation, you look at it as a presentation for a commutative group. You abelianize the problem, and then you check whether or not the abelianized version of this group is not Z. And if it's not Z, then you're winning and you're done. However, this is the bad news. This is unfortunately the abelianized, the abelianized not groups are all isomorphic to Z. And I think this would be like a good homework problem for you to think about. It's not that difficult. But the abelianization trick that worked so well when we were classifying surfaces, unfortunately, does not work here in knot theory. They all turn out being the group of integers. And in fact, this is often like a good check that you can do. When you, when you find the knot group, check if it abelianizes to the integers. If it does, then that's it does not mean that you did it correctly, but it's just a sign that you're on the right track. If it abelianizes to something else, then you definitely know you did something wrong. So unfortunately, the abelianization trick here is not going to help us distinguish between G and Z. We have to work harder. So this is now a problem in combinatorial group theory where you have to somehow argue that th whatever this group is, right, this is some, some abstract group. It, it has three generators with these relations. And you have to make some kind of argument that it's not the group of integers. And recall what we said, just because it does not look like the integers, like, for example, it looks like it's not abelian, for instance, well, we, we have to be careful. It, it does not look like it. I mean, it, it does not seem like there's some kind of abelian relation over here. So you could say this is not an abelian group. So therefore, it's not the, the integers, which are abelian. The problem is, just because it does not look like it does not mean it is, uh, it, it's actually distinct from the integers. This is a problem in combinatorial group theory, where you actually have to use some kind of process to show why the groups are actually genuinely distinct. So I'm going to show you one way how to do it. Unfortunately, uh, there are no efficient algorithms for uh, distinguishing, as far as I know, for distinguishing between different types of knot groups. Uh, and this is the reason why people who work in knot theory do not usually work with the knot group. It's just too difficult to work with. A general knot that has 600 different crossings, it's just too difficult of a combinatorial group theory question to really say much about it. So people prefer to use other methods. However, here, fortunately, the group is simple enough that you can show why it's not the group of integers. So basically what we're going to do is we will show that whatever this group is, it's not the group of integers. And so that will imply that the trefoil is a distinct knot from the regular circle. So first, we're going to play around with these relations. This is often what one does in combinatorial group theory. You look at the, the, the presentation, you look at the generators, you look at the relations, and you try to look for simplifications. So we're going to try, we're going to, try to look for simplifications make this presentation be easier to work with. So here's one of the things we can do. So first, re you realize that A3 is a redundant generator. It's redundant. Why is it redundant? Well, because you can solve for A3. So here, you cannot solve for A3 because you have two A3s. But here, you can solve for A3. You can say that A3 is equal to so you can move this over to the other side. So you can say it's A2 inverse A1, A2. So that is what A3 is equal to. You see that A3, when you solve for A3 by moving the A2 to the other side, it's equal to this. And so what we have from here is that A3 is expressible using A1 and A2. So you do not need the A3 generator. You can just remove it. Right? You can just completely remove it. Right? You can Maybe uh, what I should have done is I should probably should have just crossed it out. It's a redundant generator. Sort of like this was a redundant relation. It's not doing anything for you. So A3 is a redundant generator. Uh, what do we do next? So what do we do after this? So after this, we're going to, so maybe this is perhaps, yeah, so A2 is equal to this. And then, 
Yeah, so we can therefore say that G is A1, A2, okay? And we have a relation involving A2 and A3. Oh, so we have A1, A2 is equal to, so let's, let's rewrite this relation, but we're going to rewrite this relation without using A3. We want to sort of eliminate A3. So we have A1, A2, so we have A1, A2 is equal to A2 and A3. And then A3 would be A2 inverse A1, A2. Okay, and then the other relation, which is A2, A3 is equal to A3, A3, A1. So let's put that in there. So this would be A2, A3, and then you just substitute in what is A3. So what is A3? You see, you're trying to do everything exclusively using A1 and A2. So you kind of replace the A3 by this. Then this one is A2. So A3 is being replaced by this. So this would be A2 inverse A1, A2 is equal to A3, which is A2 inverse A1, A2 times A1. So this is what we end up with. Now this one simplifies, of course. This one simplifies to A1 is equal to, you can see that this one cancels, this one cancels with this one, and then we're saying at the end that A1 is equal to A1, which we already know, so there's no point. This one is sort of, this one is unnecessary. This is a completely unnecessary relation. A1, A2, of course, is equal to A1, A2, so it's not doing anything for us. But this is the one that's a little bit more interesting. Here we have a little bit of simplification. This cancels, of course. This goes away. And then we have A1, A2 is equal to A2 inverse A1, A2, A1, A1. And then you can bring the A2 inverse to the other side to make it look a little bit nicer. And then we end up with A2, A1, A2 is equal to A1, A2, A1. Okay, so basically what we did is these cancel, and this A2 inverse, you can bring it over to the to the left. When you bring it over to the left, it the, the inverse goes away, and you have A2, A1, A2, this is what we have on the left, is equal to whatever remains over here, so we have this. So this is an alternative way of presenting the group. Now let's just rewrite it to make it look a little bit nicer. So G is generated by two, there's two generators, and there's one relation, this is redundant, this is the relation. Let me write this one first. A1, A2, A1 is A2, A1, A2. So we have this. And now we make a substitution. We're going to call all of this, for lack of a better name, let's call that A. And let's see what happens when you square A. Let's consider A squared. So A squared would be A1, A2, A1. Let's square that and see what happens. So when you square that, you have to just repeat it twice. It's not commutative, so you have to be careful. So you just repeat it twice. And now something very interesting happens. So you have A1, A2, A1, and you repeat it a second time. You have A1, A2, A1. So you repeat it twice. And now look at this. A2, A1, A2, when it goes like this, 2, 1, 2, it can be replaced by A1, A2, A1. So the stuff in the middle, so this is A2, A1, but that does not work. So this is not working. Uh, we have 2, 1, 2. Do we have a 2, 1, 2? We do not have a 2, 1, 2. But we do have a 1, 2, 1, and a 1, 2, 1 can be replaced by this. It could be replaced by this. So we can therefore write this. So a 1, 2, 1 can be replaced by 2, 1, 2. So let's write it in here. So this would be a 2, a 1, a 2, and then we have a 1, a 2, a 1. And this is actually fairly interesting because you get 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, or if you prefer, you can also write this as A2, A1 cubed, because you are repeating these two, the 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, three times in a row. So it's A2, A1 cubed. So let's give this one a name, and let's call this one B. And so basically what we're saying is the group can be rewritten using two other generators. This is a much more simplified way of writing it. So you can write the group instead as being generated by two symbols that we're calling A and B instead. And the relation that they have to satisfy is that A squared is equal to B cubed. So that is the relation. A squared is equal to B cubed. Okay. Now, it takes a little bit of a check. It's not difficult. But you have to argue why the original generators, namely A1 and A2, are expressible in terms of A and B. So once you can show that, then you're, then you're just replacing two set of generators by two new set of generators. And then you're rewriting these, this relation using these two new set of generators, which is this. So this is an alternative way of presenting the group. Okay, so let's just say this looks different, but it describes the same group, which is, uh, this is the, like the fundamental problem of combinatorial group theory, where you have two different looking presentations, but they end up describing the same group. You can see it's the same group, because the way we get this is by manipulating the previous relations and generators, and we're putting in this more convenient form. 
And now that it's written in a more convenient form, we're going to argue. So now we will argue why this group G is not Z. Now, there's different arguments that you can do here. Uh, there are some, uh, one thing you can do is you can show that G is not commutative by, by a certain argument. But I do not want to show that argument because it will require, one can argue, extra knowledge of group theory that we do not want to assume. So instead, I'm going to give you a different type of argument. I want to specifically give you the type of argument that connects with the methods that we already discussed. So it nicely unifies with what we've seen before. So we will describe G as a type of pushout. So we've talked about pushouts a lot. So here how you can describe G as a pushout. So we're going to draw down here Z. And I'm going to describe Z using one generator, which I'm going to call C. And basically, the C is supposed to represent the number one. Because the way we generate the, the group of integers is we take one, one is a generator, and as you keep on adding one successively, you generate all of the numbers. So let me just, uh, we're going to write this using multiplicative notation, but this really represents the number one. So when you write, let's say, so C squared is supposed to correspond to two operations. It's supposed to correspond to C plus C. So that's supposed to correspond to one plus one, which is two. And then C cubed will then correspond to C plus C plus C, which will correspond to the number three. C inverse will correspond to negative C which will correspond to the number negative one. So you can see that by using powers of C, you end up generating all of the integers. So the integers can be described using this one generator, which we're going to call it symbolically by the letter C. And then we have a mapping. So we have two mappings. This is going to be the mapping into the integers again. And this time, we're going to describe the integers using the symbol A. And here we're going to describe the integers using the symbol B. Notice there's no relations here. There's one generator, and there's no relations because this is the group of integers. And we're going to have a mapping here. So this mapping, this is going to be the mapping that multiplies everything by 2. And this is going to be the mapping that multiplies everything by 3. So in other words, the homomorphism, so this is a homomorphism from the integers to the integers that takes an integer and it just multiplies it by 2. So the integer 5 gets mapped to 10. The integer 20 gets mapped to 40 and so forth. So we have this homomorphism, and we have another homomorphism. And in this diagram, we talk about the pushout. So how does one find the pushout? The pushout is actually exactly this group. The pushout, so here's the way we're going to find the pushout. Let's see what happens to this generator. So 1, which is C, it's being mapped to 2. So 1 is being mapped to 2. Now, using the generators, you're saying C is being mapped to A squared. And here, the generator C, so the number 1, is being mapped. It's being tripled. It's being mapped to 3. So using multiplicative notation and using the notation of that generator, this is being mapped to B cubed. So C is being mapped to, to A squared, and C is being mapped to B cubed. Now, in the, in the pushout, when you travel this way and when you travel that way, so the two ways of traveling in the pushout, they have to commute. They have to give you the same thing. So the pushout would be the group. So here's the way you find the pushout. You take these two symbols. You put them together. So that would be A comma B. Then the generators, you copy and paste the generators. In this case, there's no generators. And then you have to add an extra relation. And the extra relation you have to add so there's no relations to add from these two, but the extra relation you have to add comes from the fact that C being mapped this way has to coincide with C being mapped this way. So C is being mapped to A squared, and then A squared gets mapped here, and then B cubed gets mapped there. So the relation has to be that A squared and B cubed has to be, have to be the same thing. And then that right there is the pushout. So it turns out that this group that we have over here is actually a pushout of this diagram. So this is the push out of this diagram. And we want to show, OK, so let me remove all of these arrows because they're sort of getting in the way. And let me show to you, so we kind of want to rule out. So basically what we have to argue, we need to argue why this group cannot be Z. Right, that, that's essentially what we're trying to argue. We're trying to argue why whatever this group is, it cannot be the group of integers. That, that would, it cannot fit in here. Uh, and I'm going to leave this for you as a homework problem to think about. But basically, let me give you the main idea of what the problem is. So I'm going to rewrite this, this picture all over again. So this is basically the picture that we have. We have the integers down here. We have the tripling map into the integers. And here we have the doubling map into the integers. And then we're claiming that the pushout, so this is the pushout. It, it cannot, the, 
whatever this group is, right? It's a mysterious group. We do not really know what it is, a mysterious group, but we're trying to argue why it cannot be the integers. It is distinct from the integers because all we're trying to do is we're just trying to show why the trefoil is a distinct knot from the circle. So uh, it comes down to showing why this is not the group of integers. And there's a number of issues here. So we want to show why this is why this is problematic. So whatever group goes up here, it cannot be the group of integers. So here's an observation. It's not difficult to show, but this is an observation that any group homomorphism from the integers to the integers must be a multi a multiplication factor. So in other words, every group homomorphism is going to be given by multiplication by some fixed integer. So here we have multiplication by three. Here we have multiplication by two. And in general, every homomorphism between the integers must be given by a multiplication factor. It's not difficult to show. Leave that to you to think about. So there's some kind of multiplicative factor going over here. Let's call it multiplied by n. And there's some kind of multiplicative factor going over here. Let's say it's multiplied by n. Now, and if we want the diagram to commute, it means if we map it this way and that way, it should be the same thing if we map it this way and this way. So in other words, the following relationship must be satisfied. 2n has to be equal to 3m. 2n has to be equal to 3m. Now, here is the, the problem. So this is just an outline. So this is, so this is not this is an outline. This is not a proof, but this is like sort of the main idea. The problem is that we can choose n and m in ways that are not unique. So the push-out property requires uniqueness. So if you go back to the definition of the push-out, there's a uniqueness in the push-out. Push-out says that there's essentially only one way to push the diagram. There's that uniqueness part. And the problem here is there's lots of ways to do it. So for example, this number can be 3 and this number can be 2 because 2 times 3 is 6, and 3 times 2 is 6. So this, this is fine. But you can also, instead of using 3, you can use uh, 6. And here you can use 4. So then you would have 2 times 6 would be 3 times 4. That would be 12. So there's actually an infinite number of ways to do that. So it's almost as if when you put the integers up here in the diagram, there's like an infinite number of ways to push it out. There's an infinite number of different mappings you can put here that will compute with the diagram. And this is problematic because when you have a push out, there's supposed to be a unique way how to, how to do it. And that makes you feel that whatever the push out is, the mysterious group, it cannot be the group of integers. Another thing that should also give you warning signs is that in this picture, this mapping is the inclusion mapping. A is being mapped to A in this group. B is being mapped to B. These are sort of like the inclusion mappings. They have to be injective. But here, we're multiplying by 3. We're multiplying by, by 2. Well, actually, sorry about that. Um, let me take it back. These are actually injective mappings. So, sorry, so ignore that. that. That's completely, yeah, that, that's not applicable. I, I thought I had another way how to do it, but I just realized that as I was explaining it, that it made no sense. So ignore that. So the main, the main problem is uh, there's an infinite number of ways how you can push it out. In fact, you can rewrite this as a fraction. You can rewrite this into the form. You can just rewrite this by saying that uh, n divided by m is then equal to, so n divided by m, assuming they're not zero, but then n divided by m would be equal to 3 divided by 2. And then you just find different representations for your fraction, 3 over 2, 6 over 4, 15 over 10, and then these gives you an infinite number of choices that give you different ways how you can push out the diagram. So the uniqueness requirement for the push out is being violated, and that's the reason why the integers so you can use the integers to push the diagram out, but that's not necessarily a push out. The push out is the optimal way to push it out. It's the smallest way to push it out. And with the integers, there's lots of ways to push it out. So it, it cannot be the push out of the diagram. So that means that this is some kind of mysterious group. And whatever this mysterious group is, it is not the group of integers. It has to be something that's genuinely distinct. And we have just proven that the trefoil is a separate knot from the circle. So that, that's the immediate implication of what we've done. So you can look. So you can look at today's lecture and complain. You can say way too many pictures. Right? Mathematics is supposed to be rigorous. Uh, we are we use pictures to motivate ideas, but there's a formal way to write things down. So how do we reconcile this problem? So here's the way I think about it: that we can interpret 
like a knot diagram as a shorthand for a vertiger representation. So the trefoil knot that we drew, which I'm not going to try to draw again, but you know the, the, the trefoil knot that we had, this is just a shorthand, right? This picture, right? This picture, this is a picture, but this is a shorthand for a group presentation. And we had this group presentation. We had a group generated by three symbols and it satisfied a bunch of relationships. The relationships are determined by reading off the diagram. So this is, this is the picture of the knot. But this is really the formal description of the knot. The picture can be converted to that. And what are you saying? So what is the trefoil knot? So here's the way, so here's like the rigorous way. So here's a rigorous way to define the trefoil knot without using pictures. So you can say, you can say the trefoil knot, the trefoil is a knot K such that the fundamental group of its complement is equal to the group that has two generators and it satisfies this relationship, let's say. So that's the trefoil knot. That's how you can define it. You define it through the group. You can do this because of this one-to-one -one relationship that exists between the knot and the knot group. The knot group determines the knot. So as long as you give me the group presentation, there is a knot, exactly one knot, exactly one knot that will have the required group presentation. So, so this is the, the way you can formalize knots. This is the way you can formalize these pictures. So you have all of these pictures going on, right? You have these pictures. And if that bothers you, and like, how do you make it more formal? Well, one way you can make it more formal is you can um, you can convert everything back to groups, and then the trefoil knot becomes the group. It becomes the knot whose fundamental group, well, the fundamental group of its complement is isomorphic to that, and and then you're just describing the knot like more abstractly without any kind of picture. You're just saying there's this embedding. There's this embedding into S3 of a knot that has the desired that has the desired such group. So this is like the trifle knot without pictures. But this is not exactly maybe the most satisfying. So you might ask, so this is something you might ask. So sure, you can do this, but it's maybe not the most satisfying way to do it. So you can ask, uh, can you provide a careful, concrete embedding into S3 that will construct the trefoil knot with the desired fundamental group? That's what you can ask, because you could just say the trefoil knot is the knot that satisfies this. But uh, maybe not the most satisfying way of defining the trefoil knot. The, the follow-up question, of course, is to ask, can you give me such an embedding that will lead to that? Like, without drawing pictures, actually describe the embedding. Like, write out the functions that do that for you and things like that. So that's what we'll discuss next time. So next time, we will talk about porous knots. We can actually produce a large family of knots called porous knots. And we're going to show that a trefoil knot is a special type of uh, torus knot, and we'll calculate the fundamental group of all of those torus knots. So that is what um, we will do next time. And I guess to maybe finish with something, I, I guess I should have said this earlier. Um, you can you can ask, how do you prove the vertiger? How does one prove the vertiger representations that we talked about? And I would just say to use them as the definition of the of the picture. So instead of proving it, that is the definition. The vertiger representation is the definition. So when I give you a knot diagram, this is a knot diagram, you convert the knot diagram into a fundamental group. The way you do it is by using those um, the vertiger representation. So it's not something you prove. It is it is rather what you want to get. So that is the definition, right? So that, that's kind of the idea about it. That's like the common thing we do in math, that the, the, it's not a theory, it, it, it is the definition that we want. So when I give you a complicated picture of a knot, it has various vertiger representations on all of its crossings, and that gives you a group. So uh, the vertiger representation is therefore not proven, 
it is the definition of what this is more formally as a type of group. 